Shamai and welcome to Bitcoin Craft Pro, the show where we have a quick look at the Bitcoin price and some of the other markets may be affecting it. The price is 7,941.4, it's a high of 8,089.5 and a low of $7,821. Pretty much doing what I thought it was going to do, which is go sideways. It's very happy in its channel between 7,500 and 8,000. Um, that it does look like there's a, a smaller shifts up and down, which has created this nice little ascending triangle in a very short time frame. That could pop us up over up to 8,500, and also in quite a, um, I would say, quite an organic way, less less whale action. Um, so yeah, we're going sideways or we're going up. Uh, but the price is very happy between 7,500 and 8,000. So don't be surprised if it, it continues to, to bounce around in there for a while. It's been doing that for the past month if we ignore this craziness here. Let's have a look at the news feed, shall we? So Ethereum price analysis, ETHUSD technicals suggest strong breakout past $250. Uh, Ripple, blah, blah, blah. Bitcoin price analysis, when will BTCUSD make a decisive move? Um, probably soon, I think, and it's probably going to go up. So... Uh, Battle of the stable coins, could buy a stable coin be Tether. Uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, I actually think stable coins are pretty important. Um, at least exploring the technology of stable coins. Uh, and a lot of these are good um, test cases for it. Although, you know, sadly, it has quite a lot of people's uh, wealth locked in them. So if, if they fail, then that would be bad. Uh, but yeah, no, I think, you know, um, originally, I think Wide Dice B money was a, a stable coin. So I think people have realized that, you know, stable coins are... Having obviously having like a, a, a money which is quite stable in its value is quite important. Uh, cryptocurrency market update: Litecoin breaks away from Bitcoin amid broad-based consolidation. Litecoin hits 13-month high as halving FOMO mounts. Where next for Litecoin? So, um, as I mentioned, uh, well, let's see the price first, I suppose. So, Litecoin's price is at 1,300. So what? 136.9 It's had a high of 141.7, a low of 134 dollars. Um, we noticed uh, four days ago that the price had uncoupled in this huge um, run up, which I think was probably uh, a whale pumping the price and decoupling it from Bitcoin's price. And then you have then got, so I think that the price was decoupled, people got confused, the sell orders went in, and then um, people then thought, oh, the halvening, that's why the price is decoupled, and then the price is shot up from there. So, yeah, it's kind of chicken and egg. Uh, I don't think the halvening news was, was this thing which originally decoupled it, but now um, it's like a negative feedback loop. And because it's doing something different than Bitcoin, a lot of people are pumping their money into it. You know, chuck a bit of liquidity, buy a few Litecoin on the side, you might make a little bit of a tidy profit. Nice. Um, so, yeah, so it was like, yeah, 7th of June, 6th of June when it actually decoupled. And then um, this ascension looks pretty high. So, um, and we've got, you know, a while still halvening. And um, this is like, I think the halvening's in August. And uh, um, historically, it's always gone up in price with the halvening, just as Bitcoin has. So I think it's a fair, it's a fair punt that it's going to go up a little bit. Let's have a look at Ethereum. So Ethereum's just, you know, doing the same as Bitcoin. Not much to report there. The price of Ethereum is $147. It's had a high of $151.2 and a low of $143. I will say that on a very short time frame here, we have also got another uh, ascending triangle. So we'll see whether that pumps the price up. If it does, it'll probably break up to like 160, yeah, $160, that makes sense. That seems to be quite important resistance right there, $165. Let's have a look at Monero. Uh, Monero's doing the same as Bitcoin. Again, we've got a little ascending triangle thing, $88. Um, uh, it's had a high of $88.8 and a low of $85.8. So we'll see if uh, a couple of the other whales in these markets try and do a Litecoin and decouple from Bitcoin probably create some sort of like altcoin season um, but I think before they get a chance to do that Bitcoin is probably just going to pop up in price anyway so but that could happen right so what's going on with uh, what's going on with gold what's going on with gold this isn't like the gold oh there we are we're on a long-term time frame here so gold um, has done what it historically has done for the past six years where it got up to 1350 dead on the head and then uh, dropped um, and start bouncing around again. So if it, the past six years are anything to go on, then it's probably going to then go down again a little bit. Although um, those shifts up and down are getting a little bit lower, a little bit smaller, sorry, which means that we are building this, this nice big ascending triangle, which would give gold um, a good, what's that, like $300 range to the upside, taking it up to like 1,000, 
and six hundred dollars, which is a nice, um, there's some nice support for that. So yeah, currently the price of gold is at uh, one thousand three hundred thirty-nine point seven dollars. Had a high of one thousand three hundred forty-two, low of one thousand three hundred twenty-nine. Let's have a look at the news feed for gold. So gold prices up amid sino US trade uncertainty. So unlike the past six years, um, uh, well, I mean, gold, the, the, the market's currently, or the environment currently, is a sort of uh, environment which gold should thrive in. Um, so that would be another thing which could break out of that uh, resistance zone it's got there at the top. Um, so we'll see if that happens. Let's have a look at the S&P 500. The S&P 500 has you know, had that temporary pump. People are kind of thinking it's a dead cat bounce, but we have got the Fed, right to, Fed rate decision happening uh, next week. So let's have a look at the news feed. So the bull case and the bear case on Apple stock. Uh, the economy looks good on Main Street. And that's bad for bonds, blah, blah, blah. Stock rally, stock rally stalls as treasuries gain. Oil drops, markets wrap, European markets. Um, fall as crude, we use it slide. So I need to look at crude oil at some point. The S and P five hundred dead cap bounce. Um, I mean, we have got the Fed rate uh, decision being made next week, and I imagine they will make a cut, which will pump the price up a little bit more. Um, so, in the short term, the price of the markets could go up, but I think um, in the long term, it's so hard and um, awkward for companies to be able to make good decisions on um, where to put their money. So, when they're making investments, like you know, do they source materials from China or Europe or? Um, and when you've got these these tariffs and these trade wars, which could get really ugly happening, it, it kind of stalls those decisions and it has a knock on effect, which affects the long term um, prosperity of the markets. So, yeah, not not great for markets. So we'll, we'll see what happens next week, next week with the, the Fed cut. Um, so let's have a look at the Bitcoin uh, Reddit po Reddit. Just see how that's uh, how we're doing today there. So we've got the Sunday stream breaking Bitcoin. I still need to watch that. I haven't watched that yet. Um, we've got Bitcoin halvening is coming in about 345 days. So less than a year. Are you ready? It's amazing that we're less than a year away from the halvening. Um, it only feels like yesterday when the last one happened. So, and his, as I said before, let's like light coins halvenings. They've historically, for good reason, always push the price up. So, um, we'll probably start seeing some price action about, you know, for that, you know, recent, like soon. Um, uh, I mean, people... I think probably thinking about the halvening even now as the price of Bitcoin is, is starting to break out and go up again. Um, so this is nice. We've got a nice infographic here where we're comparing Bitcoin and Satoshis to sea life. Um, obviously, we've got a big fat whale there with one Bitcoin, uh, 100 million Satoshis, and it goes all the way down to like a shoal of fish, which is 10 Satoshis, which I quite like. And then I think that's like an atom, uh, but hopefully it's a bit of plankton uh, and that's one Satoshi. Um, it'd be good if it was plankton, that would make more sense. Uh, blah 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 blah. GoTeller releases white paper for mobile and the mesh network Bitcoin payments. I'm not that interested in GoTeller, like they're a commercial company, their products are overpriced and they're not very open source. If we go to their Wikipedia page, however, its license does not permit use with open source and copyleft licenses. GoTeller needs to sort that out. I'm surprised that the Bitcoin community have been as um, uh, forgiving as they have. It's a very easy way for people to feel engaged with the mesh network. Uh, so I think that's probably why uh, they've been so forgiving. But I don't think, you know, as a, as a, a trusted third party who's flashing that firmware onto that hardware, um, I'm not sure we should put that much trust in them, really. If you look at their GitHub as well, it's pretty, pretty lame. We've just got their public SDK there. Uh, so, yeah, something I'm really interested on mesh networks um, is, and I was speaking to one of the guys at the uh, Lightning Hack Day, is Cypherbox. Cypherbox, sorry, which is a fairly cheap um, and a fairly secure base system for near distributed networks, mesh networks. So yeah, mesh networks are around the corner. And as Andrea says in my first video of BTC IoT, it needs to be user led, needs to be controlled uh, uh, by the community as a whole. We need to control the software, we need to control the hardware. Or at least be able to audit the hardware. Yeah, yeah okay, we can't make um, some of these microcontrollers ourselves, but we need something which is easily accessible, cheap, has a, a good market um, with lots of different companies producing in it. So, um, uh, so Cypherbox is based on Armian, uh, Debian-based distribution for a single board ARM development board. So like Pies and all that sort of stuff. There's, there's, there's plenty of boards out there you could you can install Cypherbox on. Cool project. Uh, I think their uh, software is pretty hard to 
compile at the moment, but that'll get easier the more people who contribute towards it. So if you can, then go over, try and try and use their software, give them some feedback, um, um, and uh, yeah, give them some feedback and uh, maybe even try and contribute a little bit. It's a cool project. Um, other than that, obviously I've been working with uh, the SP32 and I've been using with Espressif's uh, ESP uh, Mesh Development Framework, which is completely free and open source and it's under um, uh, uh, MIT license, I think. Let's have a look here. Yep, yeah, so we've got MIT license. Um, so yeah, good. Um, uh, Espressif, they're the ones who actually produce the ESP32 and there are a load of uh, projects, libraries, which were being built for Arduino specifically um, for building mesh development uh, mesh sorry mesh networks and then Express have obviously realized there was a, a market for it and people are interested in mesh networks and their microcontrollers like the sp32 the sp8266 um, are all perfect for mesh networks so they've developed this mesh development framework which is you know it's it's, it's still early days but it's far more exciting than, than the go tenor project for me um, particularly because the hardware costs like, you know, five pounds or something for an ESP32. It has a range of about 200 meters, so a lot smaller range than a Gotenna, but um, it's not that hard to like slap on a, um, a little antenna onto an ESP32 and increase that range. Um, so at some point, I think I need to make like a, a knockoff um, Gotenna project. I think that'd be pretty popular um, where we flash the firmware ourselves. So yeah, on BTC IoT, uh, the playlist on the World Crypto Network, I have a couple of... Um, uh, well, like diaries on me trying to build my mesh network. I've done a little bit more work on that. I just need to kind of like put the work together on, on, in the video. Um, so yeah, get involved in that if you want to um, and uh, play around with the yeah, ESP um, uh, MDF, so Mesh Development Framework as well. In fact, let's go have a look at my GitHub, shall we? <laughs> I'll include myself here. Right. So blah, 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 blah. So let's go to where are we? Repos. Um, now our Bitcoin mesh. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so this is the project I'm trying to build using the Expressive's mesh development framework um, and using this incredibly cheap hardware. You know, I said five pounds, but actually you can use, um, uh, with a little bit of work, you can just flash the microcontrollers themselves, which are like, you know, like $2, like, you know, pound fifty or something so cheap that you can embed them in things like light bulbs and that's where mesh networks become really interesting because you end up with you know um, uh, big pipes you can use a lot of bandwidth so yeah so check out my bitcoin mesh um, uh, repo check out uh, the sp mesh development framework and check out cypherbox and just encourage gotana to be a bit more open source um, so news, let's continue with the news. So Dex explained nice article from Toy Graph here all about um, decentralized exchanges there's an interesting infographic here on um, uh, liquidity. Um, so currently we're just under a percent for decentralized exchanges, but later on it does go on to say that, you know, with a centralized exchange, it is very possible for them to manipulate the price and put their own trades in to make a little bit of cash on the side. So how much of this uh, liquidity is fake? I don't know. Um, so what else does it go on to say? Uh, it just talks about the the, 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 yeah, the risks, the benefits um, of a decentralized exchanges, how many decentralized exchanges aren't actually decentralized, they, they're sort of part decentralized. Um, also the, the uh, role which Ethereum's like DAOs and smart contracts play in building these things. So again, it's another reason why Ethereum should probably stick around for a while. Um, so people can experiment building decentralized exchanges. BISC is my favorite. If you go on there, you can very much see what people are using them for. There's a lot of Monero trades, shall we say. Um, um, there's uh, a nice quote from uh, um, uh, Satoshi Light, uh, uh, Charlie Lee here on the bank or wallet when it got hacked. So um, an exchange is not decentralized if it can lose customer funds or it can freeze customer funds. Bancor can do both. It's a false sense of decentralization. So yeah, it's very important to differentiate between something which is kind of part decentralized kind of um, and then still has maintains its own service which can be hacked or something which is truly decentralized um, uh, like BISC so uh, yeah cool project so yeah nice nice article written up by Julia uh, Magus Magus so yeah uh, what worth bookmarking um, so what else we got Canadian University offers graduate training in blockchain tech so UBC 
their master's and PhD course. Um, they're offering training in blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So um, I suppose that kind of puts us all at PhD level, which is you know, comp a nice compliment. Uh, the virus is spreading wherever it can, even through universities now, as they, they busily try and catch up with us. Let's have a look at, um, oh yeah, the last article, a bit of a dig here at Tone Phase. There's no evidence that crypto winter is over now. Yeah, I think there is. I think it's probably the price. Um, his biggest problem, which they allude to in the article, is uh, a bet. I didn't know he did this, but he made a bet in March. A quarter of a million dollar bet that the Bitcoin price will fall below $2,000 uh, before 2024. Um, if you make that kind of bet, then you've got a vested interest, obviously, then in the price going down, because um, that's a lot of money to lose right there, particularly after you know tax, etc., which he will be paying, I'm sure. Um, so I, I wish a lot of these... Uh, Public figures would avoid making these bets. It kind of feels adolescent to me. You know, I worked as an educator and it's quite it's like a teenage boy thing to do, like to bet each other all the time over little things uh, like this, kind of posturing. So I'd, 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 I'd be good if they could avoid that. Also, because it in, uh, impacts their decision making. Um, also, just selling their trading tools and stuff also impacts their decision making. So, so yeah. So, so it looks like he was wrong over that, that price shift down. Um, uh, I can't see any reason why the price would go down at the moment. There's plenty of upward momentum. And uh, the winter is over and we're in, we're in, we're in bull land. So there we are. Um, so that's it for Wednesday. And um, uh, I hopefully see you tomorrow if I'm not busy. Uh, um, I'll try and do a video. Uh, so have a good day and I'll speak to you tomorrow.